off on another epic episode of the hyper anomalous esoteric research organization podcast the hero paranormal podcast broadcasting from the base at la madre mountain just south of area 51 my name is ryan the anomalous ambassador of the airwaves bringing you an unbelievable episode today james t lukatsky colm a keller phd and George Knapp shocked the world with a groundbreaking insider's account of a secret government UFO program in their book, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Within the book's pages lie items never seen before. Speaking of things never seen, if you haven't seen past the HeroParanormal.com paywall, a bunch of content awaits. Either subscribe at Patreon under the simple search Hero Paranormal or on Podbean at HeroParanormal.com. Also, like and subscribe on YouTube to view all the free content. Subscribing, liking, and sharing are the best ways to secure future episode production and keeps the content coming to you. The amazing book Skinwalkers at the Pentagon unmasks the massive scope of the Pentagon's landmark UFO study that ran from the Defense Intelligence Agency. Not to mention possibly the most frightening, Lakatsky, Knapp, and Kelleher brought something else to us all, and that is the explanation of how the attachment, or what is known as the hitchhiker effect, related to paranormal events in the households of people who were investigating certain areas. We're going to get into that, and much more. Let's look into Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, an insider's account of the secret government UFO program. On today's episode, we have a couple of good guys who need no introduction, but I will do my best. George Knapp is an investigative journalist, frequent host of Coast to Coast AM. George is well known for reporting on and breaking the story of Bob Lazar and Area 51. Lazar claimed to have been working on extraterrestrial craft at the secretive base. In 2004, Knapp won a National Edward R. Murrow Award. He has also won dozens of Pacific Southwest Regional Emmy Awards, several writing awards from the Associated Press. Knapp and photojournalist Matthew Adams won a Peabody Award. The awards go on and on, so I think it's best to kind of move on to why I have asked Mr. Knapp on the podcast. He is co-author with Colm Kelleher of the amazing literary work Hunt for the Skinwalker in 2005. He starred in Jeremy Corbell's documentary on the Skinwalker Ranch in 2018, and more recently wrote another barn burner of a book with Colm Kelleher, PhD, and James Lukatsky, called Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, an insider's account of the secret UFO program. It is the one-year anniversary of that book release, and many of us have a lot of questions surrounding much of the discussions that have taken place around the water cooler by most who have read it, whether it be about the Advanced Aerospace Weapon System Applications Program, commonly known as OSAP, or the famous UFO case it investigated known as the Tic Tac. Many of the other now declassified plethora of bizarre phenomena are also on the list that government investigators encountered on Skinwalker Ranch. George Knapp seems to always be an insider with advanced knowledge due to his trustworthiness and his well-deserved reputation as a respected journalist. He is someone who knows more than the average when it comes to this enigma of bizarre phenomena. 
Colm Keller, Ph.D., is a biochemist with a respected research career in cell and molecular biology. He is an expert using forensic science methodology to unravel scientific anomalies. Colm has written a number of books, which sit at the top shelf of my book collection, among them Brain Trust, Hunt for the Skinwalker, and of course, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. Colm has spent 35 years plus working in a wide variety of intriguing, diverse research careers. Between 1996 to 2004, Colm led the National Institute for Discovery Science, or NIDS, on Skinwalker Ranch, as well as many other projects. From 2004 to 2008, Colm served as a laboratory director at Prosetta, where he led teams of scientists executing DOD contracts against a myriad of viruses of interest to the Department of Defense. In 2008, Kelleher became Deputy Administrator of Bigelow Aerospace Advanced Space Studies, or BASS. And from 2012 to 2020, Kelleher led the Environmental Control and Life Support Systems Department at Bigelow Aerospace. And he's one of the nicest guys, along with George, that I've ever met. George Knapp, Colm Kelleher, Welcome to the Hero Paranormal Podcast. Hey, Ryan. Good to talk to you. Good to be here. I am so happy to have you both on, especially after a year of this groundbreaking book. A lot of people gathered a lot of insight from this, and anybody who was very interested hopefully has had a chance at this point to have read it. I know there's a lot of questions. It is an amazing work. I'm not sure where to start. I know that a lot of people were tantalized by the insider's account of this secret government UFO program. Uh, I, I really appreciate that you made something known to a lot of people, which was also groundbreaking, which was this hitchhiker effect, as you termed it, or this attachment. Can we go into that for just a moment? Sure. Maybe yeah. I'll start that. Well, I'll yeah. start. <clears throat> I mean, it, it sort of um, is... is sort of transfer, transcends the, uh, the OSAP program that began in 2008, because realistically, the first example, if we, if we, if we go back uh, in the history of the Skinwalker Ranch, was the Gorman family, uh, you know, who had experienced all these bizarre events between 1994 and 1996 on the property. Robert Bigelow bought the property in 1996, but... <clears throat> Once the family had moved off the proper property, they actually moved out of state, and subsequent uh, discussions with them revealed that you know they brought something with them from uh, Utah to out of state. So, you know, the concept of something on the ranch or elsewhere—it's not confined only to Skinwalker Ranch—attaching to somebody who's on the property, that person then leaves. Uh, to another state or even another the other side of the country, and then experiences a whole set of paranormal uh, events in their environment. That's what we sort of generically call the hitchhiker effect, but it is a very, very consistent phenomenon that started really with the Gorman family, moved into the NIDS group of scientists that, we, that were on the property beginning in August 1996, all the way to, to about 2004, uh, I was I spent hundreds of days on the property. Eric Davis, another scientist, also had the same thing, um, and both of us did notice in our homes, um, our, especially our families noticed um, a an uptick in paranormal phenomena. Uh, people people walking through the house, dark shadows in the house, um, but it was at a pretty low level. Uh, frankly, until the advent of the OSAP program, which happened in 2008, in which um, trained military observers were dispatched from the Defense Intelligence Agency in order to corroborate all of the stories that were going on about Skinwalker Ranch. Well, once these military people with combat experience uh, uh, landed on the on the ranch, all five uh, in, who, all five were deployed separately at different times, and all five of these individuals brought stuff home to them to the East Coast. 
and the activity became very florid. It became very flamboyant, bizarre creatures, um, all kinds of uh, um, flying orbs, red orbs, blue orbs, yellow orbs that were flying through the, the homes. Um, some of the teenage kids in these families were waking up with, uh, with these menacing black shadows standing over their beds. So that whole uh, aspect of the hitchhiker ph- phenomenon escalated dramatically during the, during the 2008 OSAP program. And then, you know, during that program, there were also uh, literally dozens of security officers deployed on the property to discourage trespassers because at that stage, Skinwalker Ranch was becoming uh, almost like a tourist hotspot. And um, dur- during that period, a lot of the security officers um, also reported bringing stuff home with them. I mean, George can tell you uh, his own experiences of uh, what happened in, in his home. Robert Bigelow, the owner of the property, uh, also uh, experienced multiple different incidents in, in his home. So um, once the property was sold to Brandon Fugel in 2016, Fugel um, dispatched a completely separate group of people onto the property, and within a year or two, a lot of those people also uh, began to report uh, in their homes, and their families started reporting bizarre paranormal effects. So, you know, the consistency of this effect, beginning in 1994 all the way out through now 2022, it is still continuing. That's almost 30 years of dozens and dozens of different people on the property having the same uh, having the same kind of experience in terms of the hitchhiker effect, and I should just add that that uh, close encounters with UFOs in areas that have nothing whatever to do with Skinwalker Ranch also sometimes provokes this uh, this uh, hitchhiker effect. We've documented in our book a couple of incidents where this has actually happened where the individuals encounter UFOs in Oregon, for example, that have nothing to do with the Skinwalker Ranch, but at the same time, they, uh, when they go to the East Coast, they find uh, explosions of this weird paranormal activity in their, in their surroundings. So it's a, it's a multifaceted phenomenon that is entirely consistent. You know, Ryan, you've been around the ranch for a long time. You have property there. You are, are in that proximity in the basin. You talk to the locals. You know the range, the, the this panorama of weird stuff that happens in and around the ranch throughout the basin. I had a lot of really very strange stuff that sort of defies logic, defies explanation. It's so weird uh, that for UFO people, for people who are primarily interested, drawn to the ranch because they're interested in UFOs, which is what Robert Bigelow was initially attracted to, uh, it's really hard to swallow. And, uh, you know, writing this book, as as with the first book that Colm and I wrote, uh, writing this book with Dr. Lekatsky, we are confronted with really strange phenomena and the hitchhiker effect being the weirdest. It does us no good to tell a story that seems so preposterous. We're trying to be credible and, and uh, the story of a, a, a very credible and serious investigation, the Bass investigation that followed the NIDS investigation, the telling the story about hitchhikers is crazy, and I'm sure it turns some people off. But the fact is, that's what happened. You know, it, it happened again and again. It happened to me, Robert Bigelow, Colin Kelleher, Eric Davis. It's happening now. I mean, it happened during the NIDS team, during the Bass era, and it's happening to Brandon Fugel's team right now. Travis Taylor's acknowledged some of those experiences himself, taking it home with him to Alabama and having experiences at his home. And I should point out that some of the people who were there for Bass, the military people, the folks who were dispatched by DIA, are still having these experiences more than a decade later. It's not something that we made up. It's not something anyone wants to be true, but it is true. You know, those guys, those uh, those people, I shouldn't say guys because they weren't all men, who were sent to the ranch uh, during the Bass period, the stories that we tell in the book, they were there sort of as, uh, let's see what happens. They were there to, in, this, in essence, poke the bear. Let's see what happens when we send these guys there, these folks there, 
to the ranch. These trained military observers, battle-hardened, brave, courageous folks who've been through fire for the U.S. government, they go there and they have these experiences. They took it home. It, it really messed them up. It's still messing them up now. And, uh, you know, we didn't make that up. It's real. If you look at other kinds of paranormal research, poltergeist kind of research, the idea of attachments, whether they want to call them spirits or entities or whatever it is, those things have been around for a long time. We never imagined that it would pop up in the UFO world, but it is what it is. And it's hard to get your head around just the vast array of really weird stuff that's been documented both at the ranch, in the vicinity of the ranch, throughout the basin, and then in UFO encounters far removed from the ranch. But that's what's happened, and that's the story we tell in Skinwalkers at the Pentagon. And I think it's an important story. I really believe that this book also serves as kind of a public service announcement for those who are wondering. You, you, there is danger there, and it is a warning of sorts that there is something that cannot be understood, at least completely, that has very potentially dangerous effects on people. I've had family members suffer from a variety of these things when I just um, joyfully take them along for a uh, you know, curiosity's sake, and I, I can attest that this is something that is very real. And there is a chapter in Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, which delves into, this delves, this book delves into so many areas, but there is a chapter that delves into triangles, and it is called Hostile Triangles, Ours or Theirs. Given the fact that this must-read book, in my opinion, was reviewed by the U.S. Department of Defense, and cleared for public release, I was caught off guard, wondering if this is an acknowledgement of advanced spacecraft systems. Tom DeLong has come forward and somewhat validated on his podcasts and Secret Machines book franchise that we have had what is known in ufology circles as TR-3B technology. Now, if our enemies are working on similar technology, it only makes sense, in my opinion, that we should be working on something similar. So I looked up the Space Force fleet, and I was shocked by the transparency to find that they actually list the type of spacecraft they use. Uh, they come forward with the fact they have 77 craft in total at the moment, and among them the X-37B space planes. Under deeper investigation, they admit they have been flying secret missions since 2010, and a report published on the NIDS website in 2001 noted 127 separate reports of large black triangles. So, the U.S. government has admitted to have space plane technology. My question is, are they admitting there are unidentified triangles, and if so, what do they think they are, and who might they belong to if they are not ours? Well, that, that's a very good question. Um, you know, uh, as you mentioned, as you rightly mentioned, uh, NIT, the NITS group did a pretty in-depth analysis of what this black triangle phenomenon looked like back in the uh, era of 2003-2004, uh, we combined a series of databases that uh, MUFON had with, with what the NIDS group were collecting. NIDS group collected between one and 200 cases separately from the other organizations. And we also brought in a sort of a well-known UFO investigator who has since passed on called Larry Hatch. And we examined his database of, uh, of, of, of the, the so-called Black Triangles. And the consistency right throughout the 1980s, 1990s, into the, uh, the first decade of the 21st century was astounding. And these things were very, very large, silent. Uh, they would float over uh, populated areas or down highways and um, very brightly lit, silent, um, sometimes football field-sized objects. Um, and one of the conundrums that we came up with was, if this is a um, is, if this is a secret government program, why are they flying these incredibly brightly lit objects over populated areas at sometimes only a couple of hundred feet or you know treetop level? We got we got the phrase treetop level 
multiple times in our one-on-one inter- interviews with these eyewitnesses. So the question was, why would people, uh, why would the United States government be so uh, risky, risky and risking people's lives on a very, very uh, supposedly secret experimental program, flying these objects over very populated areas, flying them down interstate highways with a lot of witnesses, if they were really developing something that was was above top secret or waived unacknowledged spe- special access programs. So we, we found it very, very difficult to solve that conundrum. Uh, it does not seem to fly in the face, it seems to fly in the face of common sense that they would do such a thing. So one of our hypotheses was that the there is a another part of the black triangle phenomenon that is actually mimicking the waived unacknowledged spe- special access programs that the United States government currently has, and that this phenomenon is actually capable of m- mimicking uh, these uh, waived unacknowledged special access programs. So you're you're essentially dealing with both both the uh, the, the quote unquote phenomenon deploying these very large aircraft overpopulated areas that are mimicking uh, the uh, inventory that is within the United States government. I should add, uh, Ryan, that, you know, in those early days when the Gorman family was on the ranch, they started seeing these triangles, uh, silent hovering triangles at treetop level. Uh, I think one of the ones was described as having something like Christmas lights around it, floating there, no sound, uh, like a balloon almost, and it would flash spotlights down at the ground as if it was looking for something. They saw those things a lot of times, but they were not U.S. military aircraft floating there silently over the ranch. That's not where you'd deploy a, a craft like that, and we didn't have them in 1996, that's for sure. The idea that Column explores about mimicry actually works in both directions. It seems like we tend to try to mimic them. We see their craft in the sky, we tried to build them, and that they, or maybe it's a mind game of some sort, will in turn mimic what we're building to try to duplicate what they have. I, I don't know what the agenda is. Maybe you can get Column to open up about that, but uh, it certainly seems to be some kind of a, a mind game where they're just, I don't know if they're laughing at us or messing with us or what. Another question I had, which many have been tantalized by the Tic Tac UFO case since it was made public and Many were unaware it was originally the product of research done by OSAP. Now, however, much of this is coming out in the wash, so to speak. But uh, you knew about this years ago and kept things close to the chest for years. OSAP was up to a lot of amazing things. And unfortunately, fairly short-lived at a lifespan of just over two years, I believe, many, including myself, wish it would have continued. Do you think if OSAP would have continued, could it have made some even more substantial finds than it already did if it was allowed to keep functioning as a project? I, I have no doubt that, um, that if OSAP had been allowed to um, execute all the way out through the original, the original sort of top-level plan was for about a five-year program. Um, that would be renewed year after year uh, from the Defense Intelligence Agency. I have no doubt in my mind that um, the, if the OSAP program had been allowed to move from year two all the way through year five, there would, would have been substantial progress made. Because remember, the first two years of the OSAP program were devoted to standing up essentially a full program from nothing. Um, that the funding came in in uh, September of 2008. Uh, OSAP, I was one of the first, actually I was the first person to be hired uh, for the program. And uh, my job was to um, hire a group of people in short order. And normally it takes, uh, takes about a year to two years to hire a group of 50 people with top secret clearances and, uh, and train them. Uh, we had to do that within a span of about five to seven months. So within five to seven months, we had about a team of 50 people from uh, everything from scientists to engineers to technicians 
military military counterintelligence experts, security officers, facility security officers, and we also had to uh, go through the pro- the process of making sure that our uh, our buildings uh, were were brought up to code for the uh, storage of secure materials. In other words, secret and top secret materials. So. All of that usually takes two plus years, and we accomplished it within seven months. So, but by the end of the two-year program, the OSAP program, we had a fully staffed, fully functional program that was a, a running. Uh, I, I would say was running um, extremely well coordinated. Uh, it was um, a well-oiled machine that were running about eight to ten separate programs in parallel, and we had boot, uh, people who were, had boots on the ground in the United States. We deployed people overseas to Brazil. But, you know, all of that came to a crashing halt um, at the end of 2010 when it was decided um, that the, uh, the, the program should be shut down. So um, in answer to your question, we were really only getting started. It was like, it was like sort of putting all of this, very, very large set of logistics together that were now working perfectly, and suddenly the the uh, the program was cut. So um, I think another three years of doing what we were doing, we would have massively expanded the uh, the the data warehouse, which at the time, at the end of the two year period, had over two hundred thousand separate uh, cases, UFO cases. We were on the point of dramatically expanding that. We were also dramatically expanding the boots on the ground investigation of all of these UFO cases, both in the United States and elsewhere. And additionally, we were getting our teeth into some very interesting medical injury cases, um, all of which takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of deployment of physicians and uh, qualified people in order to investigate that. So... uh, I have no doubt in my mind that we would have accomplished a lot uh, in, if, if we had been allowed to continue for five years. I'll chime in here, Ryan. You know, it's amazing. The, the book has been out now for a year. It lays out exactly what the program did. Tic Tac was an OSAP investigation. They, you know, it hasn't been made public, the report that they put together on Tic Tac, but it was an, it's an astonishing document. Like most of the reports that they put together, that have not been released by the Defense Intelligence Agency. Tic Tac, uh, people assign it to ATIP. It was not ATIP, it was OSAP. And um, the misinformation that continues to pour out a year after the book was released is astonishing and discouraging. Uh, I saw stuff on Twitter this, this weekend uh, from people who should know better saying, well, the problem with OSAP is it didn't really get $22 million. The, the money was cut off, it was only part of that, and that's why Robert Bigelow withheld all the reports. It's preposterous. They got the $22 million. We've shown the paper trail for it. Dr. Jim Lekatsky was the program project manager. Colin Kelleher was the online guy. He was the on-site, hands-on manager of what happened in Las Vegas. They got the $22 million. They spent the $22 million. They produced an incredible amount of material in a short period of time, including the world's largest UFO database, UFO warehouse, should we call it, designed by Dr. Jacques Vallée. That was OSAP. It's since been used by other programs, but that was their work. And to suggest that somehow Bigelow withheld the reports because he didn't get his $22 million is ridiculous. He did, all those reports were submitted monthly. It was part of the contract that they signed. All that information is in the hands of the DIA. Their decision not to release it has allowed some of these kind of rumor things to fester, but it was an amazing success. I I would add further, you're not going to solve this mystery, this all-encompassing mystery of what these things are and how they interact with us and and why it's so confusing and the different kinds of paranormal phenomena. You're not going to solve that just by studying lights in the sky, by looking at military encounters with UFOs, by looking at radar returns. All that is valuable information. And it needs to be collected. And I hope Congress will continue to fund uh, that kind of research with this new organization that's been created. But you're not going to solve the ultimate mystery of what these things are, how they, why they're here, 
how they interact with us, what their interest is with us, with us, just by studying things that pop in and out of the sky. It's kind of a distraction. You need to have your hands dirty. You need to have boots on the ground. Do the kind of work that these OSAP guys did, that Bass did, and, and look at all the different phenomena. The fact is, though, as we now know, maybe this kind of research is not politically feasible anymore. It's just too darn weird. Their Congress is willing to study military encounters, military cases, aviation safety cases, things that go bump in the night up in the sky, but aren't willing to do the kind of research that NIDS and Bass did at Skinwalker, and that's too bad. We, you know, we had such a great start, and I think we'd have a lot more answers now than, than otherwise if they'd allowed the program to continue. I, I could not agree more, 100%. And I think Skinwalkers at the Pentagon provides the best image yet of the accomplishments of the OSAP program. There is a drawing in the book by Joe McMonagle, uh, one of the premier remote viewers in the world. I'm a great believer in remote viewing. However, I was shocked by the accuracy of all the buildings on the now famous ranch the mesa, trails, and pastures depicted by the exercise. To not go into extreme detail, I, I, I've i seen things in the general area that could not seem exactly human, to me at least. And in Joe McMonagle's remote viewing exercise, he described an individual, a fifth individual, I believe, who had almost unhuman characteristics and was not officially supposed to be on site. There have been rumors that Joe hinted at a subterranean chasm, a base or operation center located in the area. My question is, are these merely rumors or is there any validity to the rumors? Could there be a non-human underground angle to all of this? Well, that's a that's a really good question, I think, for the uh, the current owner of the property, Um I I know that the uh, the remote viewing part of the of the OSAP program was uh, kept minimalistic, specifically at the behest of the Defense Intelligence Agency, because the original um, the original solicitation that came out from the Defense Intelligence Agency did ask for a set of prioritized projects, and Robert Bigelow and Bass and and uh, uh, us put together a series of proposals which included a pretty large uh, uh, remote viewing program, but it was decided by the Defense Intelligence Agency just to keep it as a small pilot program because they knew from past experience that that could suck up all of the resources that was going to be devoted to this program. But bottom, bottom line was that, yes, as you say, Joe Mike Monagle did produce uh, some some extremely... Uh, accurate, accurate uh, renditions of what was going on on the property. However, as a as a group, the OSAP group never formally followed up on the underground aspects of the uh, of of what was happening on the property. Even though there were uh, there were a lot of programs that were being discussed uh, during both the NIDS and the OSAP programs, in order to start looking at ground ground penetrating radar and other technologies in order to look at that. But it's my belief that uh, the new owner of the property, uh, Brandon Fugel and his team, have made some inroads on that whole, uh, that whole question. You know, another question that is intriguing to me, and this, is, this has gathered a lot of, well, good and bad, I guess, uh, stuff because of the popularized TV show on the ranch in Utah. It has become a bit of a household name. You've had an er an interest in the area for quite some time, the both of you. Do you remember your first visits to the area and how did the area affect you? Well, I I remember, gosh, I, you know, those Bigelow bought the property in 96 and um, there had been a couple of uh, newspaper articles Kind of generic articles about strange things that were happening there, but including the UFO activity. And uh, I think Robert Bigelow and uh, John Alexander visited with the family that we call the Gormans. It's a pseudonym, obviously. People know what the name is, but Colm and I had promised uh, the ranching family we wouldn't use the name, and we haven't. 
uh, and they went there, met, met their family, heard the vast array of experiences they'd been having, bought the property, and uh, so I started hearing little bits and pieces out of NIDS in those days, but I couldn't say anything, I couldn't report anything about it. And uh, a lot of the great, the best stuff, uh, Colum, my friend Colum would not share with me <laughs> for a long time. I'll, I'll never let him forget it. It was in the late 90s when things started sort of uh, taking a nosedive, when this phenomena, the intelligence of the ranch, reacted by sort of going underground, having fewer and fewer uh, exhibitions, that I started hearing more details about it, and then I started hassling those guys to let me visit. I think the first time I got there was uh, 01, and uh, I was so excited and also a little bit freaked out about it, thinking, man, something really strange could happen here because I'm hearing these stories about the, you know, the, the predator-type creature that came out of the bushes and scared the hell out of this Grizzly Adams dude who had visited, or about the uh, incineration of the dogs or mutilation of cows or the evisceration of cats and a lot of other strange creatures and bad things that had happened to, to to animals in particular and sometimes to humans. And I'm thinking, gosh, this is a pretty spooky place. And my good buddy Colum, that first trip, we go out, we do all the things that supposedly attract the attention, you know, the arrival of a visitor and the um, – uh, we 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 started digging into the ground. We got a big earth mover and and, uh, and moved around dirt because the the story is that you know by disturbing the ground you could stimulate some activity. We built a little fire out in Homestead Three and made a bunch of noise and did some interviews. And then my good buddy Colum suggested they put me on a chair in the middle of Homestead Two and leave me there for a while. So I. You know, I'd like to say that I was really brave and it wasn't bothering me, but they did. They left me on this chair in the darkness out in Homestead, too, and a lot of bad things had happened. And then they went a couple hundred yards away to see if something came to get me. And so it was a pretty spooky moment, and things did come to get me, but it was just mosquitoes and nothing <laughs> else, nothing more sinister. But it was kind of scary. And then, you know, uh, it was a, an exhilarating experience. I loved the place. I think it was like my third or fourth visit uh, when I traveled there with Robert Bigelow, and we're sitting around, I think at John Garcia's place, column, and, and talking about impressions of the property. And I had to blurt this out. I said, look, I, I know this will be very strange, but I have a really good feeling here. I feel really good. I mean, it's a little bit energized, um, like I've stuck my finger in a socket. But overall, it's a really good feeling. And I didn't want to destroy the whole mythos of the ranch, that it was a spooky, terrible place. I always felt good. I, I've never seen anything that I would consider to be paranormal or out of the out of the the realm of possibilities uh, at the ranch. I've had some things follow me home that have been kind of scary, but overall, it's been a positive experience. My memories there are all very good, and I'm I'm so thrilled to have been had a chance to be in on it for such a long period of time. I I um I know the first time that uh, I was on the property was. Uh, shortly after uh, Robert Bigelow had purchased it in August uh, slash September uh, 1996. And, um, you know, there was a team of us had just been hired at uh, National Institute for Discovery Science. Uh, scientists, uh, there was a veterinarian, had just been hired for study of cattle mutilations. Physicist uh, Eric Davis was a physicist that had worked on Voyager missions, and uh, myself uh, with a background in molecular biology and virology. Uh, so we as a team visited the ranch, and um, uh, like George, I mean, I felt it was just a beautiful, pristine uh, landscape. Uh, we walked the property, uh, didn't find anything threatening uh, whatsoever. And then during the, the whole process of uh, NIDS gearing up to deploy people and sensors on the property to see what this family had encountered because um, at that stage all of the you know all of the activity that had been reported had been reported from the Gorman family in their sort of 18 month to two year period prior to Robert Bigelow purchasing the property um, but I, I remember one particular incident um, and this was in November of 1996 
when I was standing um, standing outside, we had put together a, a double wide command and control trailer where we had installed uh, equipment, and uh, we we also had uh, started the whole process of installing surve- surveillance equipment. Well, myself and this physicist were standing outside this particular building. And uh, this object came out, uh, came from the north, uh, traveling very, very quickly over Skinwalker Ridge, uh, which is the, the the bluff that separates the northern bo- boundary of Skinwalker Ranch. This thing was traveling at probably jet fighter speed. Uh, it was brightly lit. It was completely silent, and it came, as I said, from the north. Um, over over us, it directly uh, flew over us and then did a very, very fast uh, U-turn, uh, basically a 180-degree turn, and then flew directly back uh, back nor- in a northerly direction, back over the, uh, the bluff, and it was, um, it was gone very quickly. But that was sort of uh, the combination of, um, you know, extreme silence, and the maneuverability, sort of the astounding, astoundingly tight maneuver that this thing executed, it was almost like uh, spooky. Uh, but again, we didn't feel threatened by this. We felt awed, if anything. Uh, and this was our, uh, this was one of the first um, interactions that we had as a, a scientific investigative team. But you know. <clears throat> Day after day after day on the property, 95 plus percent of the time on the property, um, it was a beautiful, pristine, western property with cattle grazing serenely on the pastures. And then for the other 5 percent, it's almost like something just came in. Uh, All of the dogs normally would be playing around in the fields. They would all head for their kennels, and they would not come out during the time when uh, whatever whatever was sort of visiting the ranch uh, was visiting. The dogs refused to come out. Uh, there was a sort of a, a feeling of, um, it was a different feeling on the property. Um, I remember several times during that period when you knew that something was in the environment, but you couldn't see it. Uh, there were occasions when I was, uh, and, and my colleagues were down in the deep underbrush, uh, scouting around or, or using, using survey instruments, uh, when you would be absolute, I would be absolutely certain that something was close by me. Um, you know, you, I could never see anything, but I had a distinct feeling that something was very, very close to me. And occasionally I'd smell a very strong odor sort of like a, almost like a skunk-like odor, but it was different from a skunk odor um, in, in conjunction with that feeling of being watched. But a number of times that happened in the hundreds of days that I was on the property were very, very few. I mean, it was, uh, it was the exception rather than the rule, but I, I do remember that distinct feeling, which was very, very different. Uh, it was intimidating, uh, but it was very, very different from the business as usual uh, forays on this, you know, beautiful property. There seem to be places in the world that, as we know it, they just don't seem to fit into the norm. And I believe the Uinta Basin is one of those places. Native American folklore and legends have hinted that possible dark adepts may be utilizing mystical or magical practices in these areas. Have you come across anything in your research to validate these claims pointing to a cult or magical breadcrumbs surrounding any of these events? Um, we, when we first arrived on the property, we were uh, in touch with uh, some members of the tribe, but they were very, of the local Ute uh, tribe, but they, there was a, a certain level of reluctance to discuss any of the of what you've just talked about, um, there were there were certainly uh, talk of skinwalkers and these these sort of uh, overlap with uh, quote unquote rituals, uh, but there were never any specifics uh, that we could actually nail down 
uh, we we did get some stories as time went on about the uh, you know that 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 the bluff on Skinwalker Ranch was known as the path of the Skinwalker, and uh, we did hear anecdotal stories about overlaps with rituals that would be conducted, but it was all very indistinct, and the people that we had talked to um, tended not to go into any detail. A lot of generalities, no specifics. So we we found ourselves in a sort of a, uh, we we could not push that very far uh, beyond what what we we learned. I tell you, Ryan, that we've had a little bit of of, of success uh, in the years since NIDS in in getting uh, access to locals who would talk about skin the skinwalker type phenomena. Uh, you know, I remember it was one of my first or second third visits there, I got to meet uh, Junior Hicks, and it was the first time I ever heard the term skinwalker, and he pointed to the ridge and said, yeah, that's that's in the path of the skinwalker. I go, what? Skinwalker, what? The path of the skinwalker sounded to me like the title of something, <laughs> a, a, a book or a movie or something, and it, it actually became the title of the first article I ever wrote uh, about the, the ranch, which is uh, November 2nd is the 20th anniversary of that, and... Um, and so this Skinwalker stuff stuck in my head, and I started asking questions about it. And it, it was tough. It was a tough nut to crack to get the tribe to open up. But in the years since then, when uh, Jeremy and Colm and I were working on the film of the same title, we were able to connect with several of the locals who opened up about it. And it's tough to, to get them to say the word, uh, because by even saying it, you, there is some concern that you might invoke it or invite it into your life. So... Uh, but we had a lot of descriptions of creatures, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, creatures like wolfman-type creatures. And I know, again, that's the kind of story that doesn't help our credibility any because it so, sounds so outrageous. But the tribe has been there a long time. Uh, the encounters that they've had over the years, they're not trying to sell a book or or sell a movie. They're They're reluctantly sharing stories of events that happened to them. The things are real. Um, what they are, we can't answer, but they do happen, and they're real. I mean, 15 generations, I believe, the uh, this folklore goes on for at least that that we know of, which is kind of hard to hard to ignore. And a, a question which attests to the broad scope of Robert Bigelow's teams and the lengths they would go to cover reports of extreme high strangeness, I had the wonderful opportunity to speak to a special team of Native American law enforcement officers known as the Navajo Rangers, who Ah. they work in the uh, Four Corners area on reservation lands. And these are places where some of the phenomenon we consider strange or wild or much more accepted and just a part of reality there. They told stories of some events of high strangeness, be they skinwalkers reported or something else, However, they attested that at times they would arrive to these locations and Bass team members would also arrive or already be there on site investigating. So when people say Robert Bigelow was not fully invested or involved in funding research to the maximum, I have to just kind of step back and laugh at these opinions. How in the world were these teams so effective and so efficient at covering so much ground so quickly, and no matter the expense, all for answers, and was anything found in these areas of note? Well, yeah, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. Uh, we, we, um, once we had the, the teams hired and in place, um, we had a very, very successful uh, collaborative, collaborative team effort with uh, the, the MUFON Star Trek team, uh, that was at the time headed up by Richard Lang, um, and Richard Lang's team uh, was was uh, tasked with getting all of the different uh, MUFON organizations within the United States uh, funneling funneling uh, the the best cases through Richard Lang's committee, Star Team committee, and uh, we were very lucky to have struck up with a, a very collaborative. Um, relationship with uh, with that team, so that was one of the the ways that uh, Bass 
began to hear a lot of different um, reports coming out of, of all parts of the United States. And so we were constantly putting teams of investigators on aircraft, uh, air, airplanes that were driving to uh, different states uh, all around the United States. And, you know, that the incidents that you hap- you, you mentioned in the, uh, in the Four Corners area were, were one of those cases that we investigated. Um, we accumulated a very, very large amount of uh, eyewitness testimony. We obtained a lot of samples. We obtained a lot of uh, metallic samples and uh, biological samples. We had also constructed a very sophisticated uh, network of analytical laboratories in the western part of the United States. And we were going through the process of level one um, analytical chemistry, uh, biological chemistry, uh, elemental analysis of a lot of samples. But again, you know, we're talking about a very, very, very truncated period uh, a, a, a mere two years after the inception of this program. So uh, we did have a lot of samples in the pipeline uh, that were not fully or extensively analyzed, but um, we, we did have all of the, um, the actual companies lined up, and the companies were doing this level one analysis. We never came up with what could be termed the definitive um, analysis but this was a work in progress, and as anybody who has done contract research with these laboratories knows that it's a an incremental step by step process where you know you get you get a set of data on level one analysis that that then leads to the design of level two analysis so that was the the process that we were undergoing uh, when the program was shut down. It's kind of an example of what happens when you have secure funding, uh, when you have a secure government-funded program. And this, as far as we know, this was the largest government-funded UFO paranormal study in history. Uh, you know, there might be some other ones that nobody's ever heard about, but as far as we know, this is the biggest. And with funding, they could offer uh, money to support MUFON and its star team, and MUFON's star team became sort of a force multiplier. They could go out and sort of sift through cases, see which ones are the most promising, and then the more advanced teams from Bass could go and, and cherry-pick some of the best cases and really dig into them. And as you asked this at the beginning about other hot spots around the country, of course, that was, that was one of the reasons I was first allowed by Robert Bigelow and Colum to go ahead and write about the ranch 20 years ago because the activity at Skinwalker had died down to the point where they wanted to be able to deploy resources somewhere else to see if there were other hot spots. And, in fact, there was a lot of information that came in about other hot spots, places like Yakima, Sedona, in particular Dulce, which, uh, you know, Bass put some resources into that. Uh, Colum spent a lot of time on the ground around Dulce, tracking down some of the stories there. And while some of the biggest ones about uh, secret underground UFO bases uh, were not confirmed. There were a lot of other things and phenomena that were confirmed. Also, Bass, uh, by putting boots on the ground, by going to the sites of these hot spots of different kinds of activity, they were able to debunk some stories. They didn't just accept everything that was being told to them by the locals. There's a ranch that purported to be like Skinwalker in Arizona, and all kinds of wild claims made about battles with aliens that they were able to basically effectively throttle and, and uh, pull the plug on it. It found, uh, found that it had no credibility. The, the, the lesson being that when you put money into this stuff, you can get some answers. You can get evidence and documentation and information, but yet it has to be a steady source of, of funding. You can't just pull the plug on it. And you have to be willing to follow the evidence where it leads. That's the real le- lesson from OSAP and Bass is, Follow the evidence where it leads. You might be looking for UFOs and structured craft, but as you're investigating different kinds of incidents and encounters, it leads you in a totally different direction. That is the nature of the phenomena. It doesn't uh, purport to our expectations. You have to follow the evidence where it leads if you're ever going to get any answers. And that's the sad thing, I think, about where we are now is the, all the discussion of a new program 
is that it's going to look at military encounters and strange things in the sky and radar sightings and things of that sort, whereas the, the real fundamental things that affect people, our human interaction with whatever this is, is something far different. I'm so glad you mentioned that, George, because as they say, you can't trick a trickster, and which attests that things weren't being made up. In fact, when things died down, the teams went elsewhere looking for evidence. And uh, that, that, I think that speaks volumes of where the research was and how the investigative um, prowess was taking place. But did, some events did happen in the Uinta Basin. And there was an event that took place on the now famous ranch, which involved a creature which has had a bit of a cult following, which involved something dubbed the Dino Beaver. And Uh that, uh, for better or worse, this documented event has gathered a lot of attention. And as you mentioned uh, in the book, a female with the highest credentials was present, if I believe. And I, for one, 100% can attest that strange creatures are seen in the vicinity when I've had the opportunities of very simply on a civilian basis talking to people in the area. And people have targeted this portion of the book, in my opinion, as focus. And I believe they, they, uh, they've had, they haven't, I don't know, they, folks that haven't had some experience in the area can target this and see this type of thing as not only impossible, but in my opinion, it seems very plausible. Uh, can we tell listeners a bit about this particular phenomenal account? Yeah, um, well, you know, as, as a sort of a, a subtext, um, the numbers of credible witnesses that we've had over the years, uh, both on the ranch and surrounding the ranch, um, reporting unusual creatures has been quite substantial. And, you know, we, we have also, uh, the, the NIDS group and the OSAP group have also gone into, uh, into areas and found that people do actually make up stories about creatures if they want to get part, get, get, get part, you know, get on the, the bandwagon, so to speak. So we've been involved with debunking stories of these kinds of creatures also in the areas around around the Skinwalker Ranch. But the particular incident you're talking about happened uh, during um, 2009 when uh, myself, Robert Bigelow, and this, uh, this person, an analyst from Defense Intelligence Agency, uh, visited the property, um, and it was late summer, I believe, uh, from what I remember. And the particular pasture that we focused on as we... Uh, walked the property, and this was about 10.30 to 11 at night, uh, was exactly the same area that George had talked about where he had been uh, in a chair uh, sort of waiting for something to come out at the night uh, many, many years prior to that. But a uh, long story short is that we had three chairs um, in this area very close to uh, what we know as Homestead 2, um, and they were they were set in a uh, semicircle so that each person was looking outwards from that semicircle. So we covered the entire 360 areas of this of uh, 360 degree area of this um, of this small pasture. So at one stage, um, Robert Bigelow decided to move down uh, in a southerly direction down the, uh, the tree line of this small pasture. I started uh, off in, in the direction uh, which would be west uh, towards, uh, towards the tree line. And Juliet, Juliet Witt um, was, was becoming nervous because it was her first time on the property. She'd heard all the stories, and she was, she was pretty anxious. So at one stage, um, out of nowhere... Uh, during this this whole process, I saw what looked like uh, a, a I would say it's probably a 200 pound animal that was shuffling past me in the direction of Homestead Two, and it it, it looked like it had uh, and this was remember this was like uh, 
probably close to midnight, somewhere between 11 p.m. and midnight, it looked like it had spikes on the back of this, and it looked like also it had a, uh, a large flattened tail. It, but it was moving um, in a very strange way. It was moving silently, and it was moving past us probably, um, I'm estimating this at maybe 40 to 50 feet, um, and it was moving in an orderly direction. Both uh, Juliet, who was further south, and, and I saw this thing moving silently. Now, all of the crickets and all of the, 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 the night noise had stopped during this whole thing. And this creature was ambling, I would say. It wasn't, it wasn't um, frightened or it wasn't sort of, uh, didn't seem in any way disconcerted. It completely ignored um, myself. It completely ignored this uh, this other person, Juliet Witt, and headed down north and then disappeared behind the, the building, which was uh, Homestead 2. And every step it took, it should have generated rustling. There was no rustling. It was kind of like a, um, a lack of sound. For, for want of a better word. A few seconds after this creature disappeared around the corner, uh, both myself and Juliet Witt walked relatively quickly, you know, following the path of this creature. Uh, when we got around the, the side of the building, there was no sign of the creature. We walked all the way up north until the end of Homestead 2, uh, beyond that uh, in an orderly direction, there's a, a, a track that runs the whole east-west length of the, the property. We went all the way up there. There was still no sign of the creature. At that stage, Robert Bigelow, who had been much further south, uh, came up and joined us and briefly looked in the area for the creature. Uh, no sign of this, uh, of this creature. And, you know, it, it was one of those sort of uh, moments when um, all of the noises in the uh, around the you know around the property that normally takes place, all of it became silent. All the cricket noises stopped, and um, for want of a better word, you know I've seen descriptions that that that, that call the Oz effect. Um, so, you know, I I saw this creature. I I heard no sound whatsoever. Um, the creature was not sort of present when I when I you know went went after it to look look for it, um, and it was one of these anomalies that happened on the property that I have no explanation for. Wow, yeah, it is one that enthralls me. Hunt for the Skinwalker. I I mean I can't believe it's been twenty years. That that ages me as this still seems cutting-edge literary work to me. And Skinwalkers at the Pentagon is an absolute must-read, in my opinion. Extremely well-coordinated literary work, which is very much uh, belongs on everybody's bookshelf. As we wrap up, for those who haven't had a chance to read the book, where do you recommend they purchase it? Um, I think by far the easiest way to purchase it is on Amazon. Um, it is, you know, it was, uh, it was published through, uh, the Amazon system. So by far the easiest way to purchase it is, uh, Amazon. It's, it's available in paperback. It's available on Kindle. And actually in the next, uh, several weeks, we hope that the, there's an audio book version of Skinwalkers at the Pentagon will be made available. We don't have an exact date for that yet, but, uh, we're pushing as hard as we can uh, to make sure that that is available, hopefully in the next month or two. I would add this, Ryan, that the uh, the book's been out a year now, and uh, judging by some of the ridiculous things that are said about Sap and Bass, either people didn't read it or didn't pay attention to it or decided to disregard it. People who should know better, who make statements that are just flat out wrong. This is the story of the real program, it's an accurate story of the largest UFO paranormal study ever conducted by the U.S. government. We wish it had been allowed to continue. We're glad that Brandon Fugel and his team are carrying on the research. 
as you'll notice, you know, the, the phenomena itself evolves. It was different under NIDS. It was different under Bass, and it's changed again and how it manifests itself with Brandon and his team. And uh, who knows what it'll be next year. But uh, Colm and I and Dr. Lekatsky are continuing to work on these issues, and, uh, and we have a lot more to tell. But for now, uh, that book of ours is the best account of what the big study was all about. Many thanks for taking time out of your very hectic schedules to discuss something very important to me. Thank you both for your work and for your time. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan. Good to talk with you. Amazing conversation with definitive experts in a field they are all too familiar with and subject matter they care highly about. If you have not purchased this book, I highly urge anyone wondering about things to read it. A very important item to note as to the efficiency of the secret government UFO program is that by the end of the program, more than 100 separate technical reports, some of which ran to the hundreds of pages, were coordinated documenting the data. So dig in and take a look at Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, an insider's account of the secret government UFO program. Until next time, keep your eyes to the skies. Feet on the ground, but don't forget to take a look around. Come blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like it need Vizine. Blast off. Blast off. Blast off. Blast off. Come blast off in my time machine. Third eye feeling like a Nevi. Blast off. Blast off. Blast off.